Good evening. I'd like to walk over right to the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees, Tuesday, February 14th. I'd like to ask for a call to order. Mr. Kayleen? Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Present. Mr. Quadro? Present. Dr. Janelle Pearson Campbell? Yeah. And Mayor Ciara is doing it. I'd like everybody to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mission statement. Smith's vocational in Agricultural High School is to prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. At this time, I ask if there's any participation by the public. That would be me. So this is getting taped, right? Yes. Recorded. Um, my name is Christina Peterson. I'm a resident of Northampton, and my property almost abuts the Smith Farm Fields. And over the past several decades, I've worked with the school, Tim Smith in particular, to try to manage the um, dog walking activity there. And uh, I took a walk with Julie last year, and we came up with some solutions to help manage the property. And Rich, I understand you're the property committee now? Yes, okay. chairman, chairperson. Okay. I um, had some written comments to give you today, but my printer went on the blink. And I know you have a lot of work to do tonight, so I won't go through my written comments. I will send them to Rich, and if Rich wants to distribute them to the rest of you, I guess that would be your decision. Um, there's a lot of overuse there now. You know, the land is just being loved to death. And I think that, um, you know, the train left the station a long time ago as to whether or not dogs would be walked there. They are going to be walked there. But uh, I think that there's some work we can do on all the erosion that's taking place there. And uh, so I have found some suggestions for that. So, Rich, I will send this right. to you, and maybe we can set up a, a walk or a meeting with Tim. At the farm. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any participants by the trustees? Yes. Please. Um, Lisa Clausen, who facilitates the policy group on tradeswomen issues, reached out to me and our guidance staff about holding an information session, especially for girls and non binary students to learn more about careers in the union building trades, which offer excellent benefits and starting pay. Uh, she'll be here on March 9th and 15th, and I encourage her to contact Northampton High School as well. On a different topic, last week, Massachusetts civil rights advocates filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education <coughs> charging that selective admission standards in vocational schools discriminate against low-income students, students of color, English language learners, and special education students who are accepted at lower rates than their counterparts um, not in these groups. Admissions criteria is an issue that I have been closely examining in my role on the Vocational Technical Education Advisory Council, and of course, Dr. Lincoln Hooker and the team have been for several years. There are roughly twice as many applicants to vocational technical schools than there are slots available each year statewide. Schools currently select students using criteria like middle school grades and attendance record, but they've been encouraged to consider, consider a lottery instead so that all applicants have an equal chance of accept, acceptance and enrollment. Dr. Lincoln Hoker has spoken to us before about Smith Vocational's attendance policy, and I know he will again. We may decide to make changes without waiting for a mandate from the federal government. If anyone wants to know more about this important issue, please don't hesitate to contact me, and I invite anyone who has thoughts about it to share them with me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, property subcommittee report. Um, we've uh, 
finalized our relationship with Deets Architects, who was hired to do a feasibility study for the rebuild of the horticultural building. And we just received the, uh, the construction cost estimate by uh, estimating service. And currently, um, we're about, well, built into this cost estimate is considerable contingency because the start date would be April 24th. And that appears to be reasonable. Um, backtrack a, a step though. Um, next Wednesday, we're opening bids for the uh, our RFP for OPM services, which is required for the Mass School Building Authority of a project this size. The project will be at least $5 million and upwards to possibly seven plus, which we can't really afford at this time. Uh, so we're looking at the next phase and hopefully next week we'll be uh, identifying who will be hiring as an OPM to help put the process together in terms of going out to bids for uh, design services. Rick, um, can you tell everybody what OPM means? OPM, Owner's, Owner's Project Manager. And this is required, like I said, by the Mass School Building Authority. That will be... We, we're not sure if we're going to have to reach out to them for funding. We're hoping to fund this in-house in some way or another. We have other projects down the road that we will need to reach out to MSBA. And uh, currently, like I said previously, uh, built into this current construction budget of 7.432 uh, includes approximately $1 million of contingencies, which some of that will probably be spent, but we're certainly hoping we don't need that sort of contingency amount. And uh, part of it is uh, escalation costs. They're targeting at 6.4% if the construction started spring 2024, and 12% for design and, con design and estimating contingency. Uh, the report we have, the construction estimate we have to date has been uh, very detailed and very well thought out based on the uh, conceptual drawings that these architects had prepared during our process and essentially about since uh, since June um, we got them on board right away uh, we know this is a, a priority and we're trying to keep moving this forward um, so next week will be our first step in in really starting to move it forward to uh, reality um, so that's our main our main priority on the property committee uh, but we have a lot of uh, on campus projects that um, Tim our facilities director can bring you up to date on if, well, we'll get to that later on. I will just focus on the uh, horticulture building at this time and let Tim uh, bring you up to date on the on campus projects. Thank you. So I'd like to just uh, say welcome to everybody here tonight. Uh, we did have a great subcommittee meeting today. It, uh, we're starting to get down for the brass tacks on getting a new building built and, and uh, the taking down of the old building. But the thing is that we, we are asking for everybody's input on this. We're not one person making this decision. I want to thank everybody that is on the subcommittee meeting, uh, the teachers here, the instructors here, uh, the administration that has done just a lot of hard work to pull this all together and there's a lot more to do but uh, I just want to have it on the record uh, my thanks uh, as chairperson about that. At this time may I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the January 17th Board of Trustees meeting. So moved. Second. Second. Is 
So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, Joe, adult education spotlight. Yeah, I'll turn it over to Lorena Turner, who's our adult education director. Okay, thank you. Um, I have <coughs> a little uh, paper here for everybody to share. And I'll be quick. Um, so what I did is I just listed the courses that we're offering this spring. Um, <coughs> medical assisting, um, electrical code and theory, home repair, oil heat tech, phlebotomy, small engine repair, woodworking, and a welding course. Um, I've also included the number of students that, have, that are enrolled in each class, and if you look at the bottom, uh, uh, small engine repair, woodworking, welding, um, we're still enrolling, um, <coughs> actively enrolling, so that number should go up. And um, what I did is I kind of just totaled uh, what we made with everything taken out, like teacher stipends, um, uh, books, certification exams if the class had them, um, um, all sorts of things. And so we ended with $78,814.60. Um, I also, uh, this is the highest in the spring semester that we've, we've done so far since I've been here. So um, that was really great. Um, but I also wanted to add that we, <clears throat> we are also bringing in with the grant that um, that we got for this the culinary culinary arts CTI grant. Um, we are currently we started um, the first cohort um, with ten students. Uh, January seventeenth was their first day, and they're going to go until June thirteenth. And with that, um, you know what goes to the adult ed? Uh, there's three thousand five hundred dollars of uh, startup oversight. Um, which we actually uh, sent out for four. Um, but in total for this one cohort, it will amount to 10,500 uh, 10, additional on top of the 3,500. Um, those are just oversight hours of the whole program for this cohort. And then in September, <coughs> in cohort two, and we'll have that same amount minus the startup because we already did the startup. Um, we are also running um, the nurse aid program, which we um, partner with uh, Center for New Americans. This is their uh, sixth year in doing the grant. Um, this is their final year. They've decided to not continue any longer. They found um, some struggles with um, the population that they're serving um, and in passing the <coughs> nurse aid exam. Um, our teacher does very good with getting them to pass the, the clinical part, the, the practical, but they have trouble passing the written part because of their language barrier, and so they've decided um, to discontinue it. Um, and this will be the final year. Um, I put down a projected based on last year. Um, last year, there were 100 oversight hours that um, I charged. And so that amounts to uh, seven thousand dollars. I, I don't know if it'll be that much this year, but it'll be a ballpark. So I just kind of wanted to put that in there as well. And I, do you want to talk about? Could you just expand on the CTI grant, what it's focused on, and sure. also the the cost oh, okay. for students? Yeah. So uh, the CTI grant um, is a grant that we applied to uh, with the Workforce Board, and the main purpose of that is uh, basically getting um, people who are unemployed or underemployed um, trained in a technical uh, area and um, out there working. So this is uh, like a start to finish of recruitment of who's eligible, um, which we did. We recruited 10. We actually had a lot of applicants, and we had to... Um, cut it down to 10, um, and uh, those 10 are currently coming to class uh, Monday through Thursday nights every week, all the way up until June. It includes an externship, a 40-hour externship, which is actually paid through the grant, um, and employment um, assistance. So I work and partner, I partner up with uh, Mass Hire Franklin County, and uh, there's three people that I work with over there. 
we are um, closely uh, watching their attendance and sort of success in the whole program along with um, we will be getting them ready around March we're going to be starting them with um, career services such as writing a resume um, we're going to help them how to do a cover letter we're going to help them with interviewing skills all sorts of how to get a job um, <clears throat> get the job that we're hoping for in the in this career and we're actually going to connect them with employers that are actually have said to us yes we are interested in your students so there's so many people involved in the success of uh, these students going through the program um, and a lot of support for them um, we are very happy with with the with the students that we recruited and we we feel very confident that they're going to be successful we're tracking them we have a database that we enter all the information in that I've been doing um, that will be uh, you know they will the state will be looking at um, success uh, <coughs> for this um, so the grant total was uh, that we were awarded was about 150 yep. um, but that's for two cohorts um, and that includes uh, everything from their uniforms, shoes, um, uh, knife sets, and books, and a variety of different things that, um, that they get in this program, along with certification exams. All of that is all paid for through the grant. It's all inclusive. There's no cost to the student? There is That's zero fun. cost to the student. This is all funded through the grant that we received. Do you um, keep a record of where the, all of the um, students live? Yes. So we had to register them into this database mm -hmm. called Apricot. It, not just the culinary arts students, but oh. all of the participants in the oh, education yes. program. Oh, yes. Yes. So I, I track all of that as well. I would, yes. I'd be interested to see um, where they live. If oh, okay. they are concentrated in Northampton or if they're in other communities yes. and what the relationship is with our sending districts. Sure. Because that's another benefit to the school. Absolutely. Right? Uh, believe it or not, a lot of our adult ed students um, in the medical, which would include um, medical assisting and phlebotomy, come from Holyoke or surrounding towns in Holyoke oh. because um, we are accepted uh, with the WIA program, the WIOA program. Um, so a lot of them are coming here being paid through the WIOA, um, and most of people that are sent from, from Mass Hire are the Holyoke office is sending them, and so those are the surrounding towns. We also have Greenfield. We work with Greenfield, and we actually work with Springfield too. So Springfield sends us people, and so doesn't Greenfield. So all those surrounding towns in Greenfield, and all the surrounding towns in Springfield, and in, um, in Holyoke, are sent to us um, so uh, but electrical um, they're just all over the state as well um, well mostly Western yeah, yeah. Um, and we also uh, receive funding well I should say we're also accepted in the workforce training fund program so um, there's a couple of classes <coughs> that I've uh, sought out to get approval for which I am approved now for um, the oil heat technician course. Um, what the uh, workforce training fund um, does is it actually works with employers. So what I do is when someone is interested in, let's say, the oil heat technician course, I ask them, who's your employer? And then I connect with the employer and I let the employer know, if you pay the tuition, then um, you can fill out this application, the express program, and in order to fill it out, they have to have a certificate of good standing. Um, they fill it out, there's 21 days that they have to approve it, and once they're approved, then um, what happens is they pay the tuition up front to me, so I already have the tuition, but at the end of the course, they submit for reimbursement, and they get reimbursed 100%. And so I just did it for the welding course that we're offering, which starts in March, and we actually got someone. We got an employer, uh, some tool making company, um, actually 
uh, applied for this express program, they got accepted, and now the student is going to be coming through that, the employer paying but getting 100% reimbursed. If the company is less than 100 employees, 100 employees or less, they get reimbursed 100%. If they are bigger than that, they get reimbursed 50%. So just knowing that this is um, like kind of a game changer for a lot of the employers, yeah. we're getting more and more people coming in and taking our courses. So as you can see, like the uh, oil heat technician course, um, did really well this semester, whereas last semester we kind of just cut even, but this semester I had time to connect with employers and we were able to have those employers pay for their, their um, employees. Um, and what my hope is, is with the welding course, um, to keep offering it at least one semester a year and uh, reach out to these employers and let them know if you send your employee here, for this course, then um, you know you can get reimbursed 100%. So that really, and we actually got WIA to accept welding too this semester. So we, I have someone in, in the WIA. I call it WIA, but it's the WIA program. So um, you know, just <coughs> knowing what our resources are and reaching out and um, getting this all together really does make a huge difference in the amount of people we can attract. Yeah. I just want to highlight Lorena. I know Dr. Lincoln Oker probably would too, but you know, when we started this program, we were about $150,000 in the hole when Lorena took over. <clears throat> and because she's able to go out and um, build these relationships and, and understand the programs that are available and assist us with you know, writing grants collectively for these things, um, she really has, has made this a, a huge success. So. And it's such a wonderful resource for our region. Absolutely, and uh, there's so many people who want the trades, yeah. uh, to get trained on the trades. Not everybody's lucky enough to come he here as a high schooler and graduate. So, you know, here we are with people who are in their 20s, their 30s, even 40s and 50s saying, I want to learn this trade, and we have those opportunities. And a lot of times the barrier is, um, how do I pay for it? And we're trying to break that yeah, barrier awesome. um, as well. And, you know, I didn't know when I came here, I didn't really know a lot about electrical. I didn't know a lot about plumbing. I didn't know anything about welding. And, um, you know, it's just really asking a lot of questions to those instructors and, you know, understanding what it takes to get someone to work in the field. Um, so I've been learning, and I'm sure there's more to learn. But it's it's key because answering those phones, uh, answering the phone when someone calls saying, I'm interested in electrical, having that information about, you know, do you understand it's a four-year commitment? Um, and also, not only is it that you come to, to school, because they think that they're going to, you know, have hands-on with electrical. It's not. It's all code, you know. Um, so they have to understand that, and they also have to obtain an apprenticeship. Um, so just understanding that whole process um, is, it's helped me yeah. to guide people whether or not this is the right program for them, yeah. for what we offer. Awesome. Yeah. I just want to piggyback what Mr. Bianca just said. I Just th thinking back when Lorena, Lorena, when you first started, and your background is phlebotomy. Right? right, phlebotomy medical sustaining. Yeah, and when you first started, you know, we were in the hole, and you had a, an industry expertise in one particular area. Yeah. And I just keep envisioning this like exponential growth chart. You know, so that, you know that growth was a little slow at first because you were learning and you were still new, um, and now it's almost vertical uh, to the point where I just want to caution the board and, and make the board aware of what I'm going to keep encouraging you to do um, is that Lorraine is only one person. You know, so your whole report focused on I I I, which is you deserve all the credit in the world. Um, but at some point, that exponential vertical growth is going to begin to plateau out because you're just one person. Right. Uh, you need help. Yeah. Uh, so you know, we've been talking about in the system for the arena, uh, when you see the profit, uh, you have more than enough revenue to support help. Uh, so as we begin to plateau, I think you now see another increase. So again, it's yeah. all because of you. So oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And I'm also encouraged about, you know, if we do continue to apply for grants, um, these grants do help us um, add, and um, so that kind of gives us a good security of, you know, this is, um, you know, what we can expect to make. Sometimes it's a surprise, you know, it was a surprise to me that we made 
almost 80. Um, and, you know, but having the grant, but that's not even adding in the grants, but having those grants really do help really use that buffer. You have that knowledge and, and the fact that uh, the Hampton County Mass Hire has reached out to us to host the Advanced Manufacturing Program. Right. Uh, when yes. you think of just a population hub, Hampton County is the most populous county in Western Mass. Mm -hmm. Yet they can't find a location for advanced manufacturing, so who do they call? You know, they, they call Ghostbusters, and they call it yeah. educational. Right. Uh, so again, it's just another reinforcement of what's happening here at Smith. So, good yeah, job. Absolutely. Thank I you. also want to compliment you because I've been around long enough between being on board trustees as well as attending the school, and I've watched the growth that we brought adult education back, and the trustees were able to fund it from the get go. As Joe said, it it was in the hole in the beginning, but between everybody's efforts, we stayed with it. And today, we're recognized by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts about the adult ed and the job that you've done. So the public relations for our school is fabulous, and thank I want to thank you. And I hope uh, adult ed is here to stay. For it is. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, difficult to see from, from where you're sitting, but some of our typical highlights over the past month. And as a reminder, sort of has a, a few bolded items, some italicized items to highlight what's happening around uh, the, uh, the superintendent goals, along with some of our equity focus uh, work over the past month. So uh, as the board knows, I'm involved with the MIA, with the, the TMC, big acronym, but again, that's the Tournament Management Committee, uh, through the MIA, which is the Athletic Association at the state. I had a meeting back in uh, middle of January, I'll actually be down there uh, at the office tomorrow for another meeting. The MAVA CPA, uh, CFS, that's the Connecting for Success Conference, uh, which is a big MAVA professional conference that we host in late June, typically after we get out of school in June, uh, depending on the, uh, the particular winter. I'm on the steering committee this year as the MAVA president. We had a first uh, meeting a couple, uh, a few weeks ago now. And just talking about the theme, looking at how do we get um, uh, presentations, how do we get the vendors for a vendor fair, uh, so it was a chance just to meet the, the players across the state, and it does promise to be a very uh, well worth conference. Uh, we sort of had a, a downturn during the pandemic, we tried to have a, an online virtual conference one particular year, uh, which was kind of difficult. Uh, last year we were back in person for the first time, I think this, this spring will be a very large conference. And then uh, you look outside, there's no snow, and it's going to be 60 degrees this, you know, this week. Uh, and it seems like we've had no snow days. And, uh, but we had this bad thing going on around a weekend. Uh, we had a snow day on that Friday, a snow day on that Monday, even though there's very little snow. Uh, so I was a little disheartened by that, that we had to sort of waste up snow days. But it was the right decision. And again, for the public, just to understand, uh, when we at Smith make a decision about a snow day, it's not necessarily what's happening in the confines of the city of Northampton. Uh, it's really uh, what's happening in Western Mass, and more importantly, what's happening with all of our setting districts. Because as a reminder, our non-resident students who have transportation from the, the non, uh, from any other community outside of Northampton, if that particular community uh, has a snow day, that town will not transport the students to Smith. So at some point, uh, it doesn't make sense educationally to have a, a school day here at Smith if 50 or 60 percent of our student body won't be in school. Uh, so while Northampton may be raining, we may have to cancel school uh, if we have uh, so many uh, towns from the hill towns uh, closing. And after those two snow days, I had to go down in, uh, to Devons, and I was traveling Route 2, and you look at the snow up in the northern part of Massachusetts, it made me feel more comfortable that the snow days were worthwhile because a lot of our families were dealing with snow. Uh, so I just wanted to put that out there. Speaking of going to Devons uh, on the 24th, so again coming out of the back-to-back the -back snow days, the mob officers, uh, our tradition is to speak to Leadership One, which is a, a leadership cohort and put on by MAVA. And it's it basically teaching and training current teachers on how to be our, their future leaders within vocational ed. 
So we go down there and we talk to the students about uh, what leadership looks like, what is management, uh, what is MAVA, and, and really kick off that cohort on the, on the right note. So we had that opportunity on the 24th of January. It was a busy week. The next morning we had our general advisory meeting in the, in the restaurant. A great chance to listen to the program chairs talk about budget priorities uh, as we're you know, in the midst of, of the budget season. So that was that meeting on the 25th. My first time, uh, in my experience, Mr. Bianca, you can correct me if I'm wrong, was the first time that we hosted a visit from uh, our colleague at JFK. Uh, so the interim principal, uh, Miriam, came here for, the, uh, for a tour uh, that Mr. Bianca and, and Ms. Charity walked her around campus showing the, the vocational shops, talking about the school, talking about the offerings, and then we had an opportunity to have lunch together in the restaurant. And um, I think her eyes were opened. I think as far as the resources and the opportunities that we have for the students, Knowing that we have 20 to 30 percent of our students come from Northampton, so obviously coming through JFK, I think it was a great uh, conversation that we had, uh, and hopefully we can start a tradition where you know, we have these visits and, and, and collaboration between the two uh, districts. So that was a great day. Then we got into Unit H negotiations. Unit H is our administrative uh, unit. We had our first negotiation session on January 30th, and, and that's going well. On the 31st, as you see, that's italicized. Uh, we are, again, in the midst of our mindfulness training session. Uh, this is sort of the pre-work. This is to teach us how to do the work of the equity work that we're going to have with City Weeks Bradley coming up in the next couple of months. Uh, and, and we're really getting into some, I think, some deep conversations. Uh, I know I'm learning a lot, reflecting a lot. <clears throat> so you'll see a, a lot of mindfulness sessions uh, through the, the updates. I want to thank the mayor. Uh, the evening of the 31st uh, is the annual tradition that the mayor uh, meets with the city council, Northampton School Committee, and now with the new bylaws on uh, the Smith Vocational Board of Trustees. It's sort of a, a joint conference. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we're still virtual. Hopefully, we'll be back in person relatively soon. And uh, I just want to thank the mayor for being very clear, logical, talking about the current state of affairs in the city. Uh, I always learn something. One thing I just want to point out, I pointed out to my, my leadership team afterwards, the I'll be the first one to admit the promise or the, the dreaming of a lot of revenue from the cannabis industry. And, and we saw this big spike. Uh, and my hand was definitely getting into the cookie jar as far as potential revenue to support the school. Uh, but then after that, that uh, the initial year, you'll see the revenue <coughs> keeps dropping and dropping and dropping to the point of I'm not expecting a whole lot. So uh, that was my big takeaway. Uh, but I'm sure there's a lot more takeaways at the board to share. But uh, anyways, it always sounds good. But then when the money doesn't dry, um, it's kind of dries up, then what do we do? So that was the 31st. We had another mindfulness session. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Spencer Robinson uh, mentioned the, the issues statewide around admissions. So as the, the MAVA president, I was part of a meeting with attorney Paige Tobin. So MAVA has uh, contracted her services uh, to represent the association around the admissions regulations and the, 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 the suit that was submitted at the federal level. Um, yes, the, the concern is, as selective criteria, and as a reminder to the board, the selective criteria is a federal law. So it does allow vocational schools to use selective criteria with the premise that we need to identify the students who can benefit from our services. So who can benefit from a vocational education? We are allowed to use selective criteria. However, the selective criteria cannot be biased against any protected classes. Uh, so that's the issue. Okay? Uh, the argument from the vocational world is that we want to ensure that students who are that enroll in a, in a vocational education, uh, they have the basic level of competency so they can read complex technical material, they can follow basic safety procedures. When you walk around campus and you see a 15-year-old up in a tree with a chainsaw, you want to make sure that they can follow basic safety procedures. They're an advanced manufacturing uh, machine shop, and they have a quarter of a million dollar CNC lathe uh, or mill purchased by taxpayer money. We want to make sure that all fingers stay intact and nobody gets hurt. So there's definitely a need to review applicants to make sure that students are able to benefit from an education. We also want to make sure that we're not biased and we're not hindering the opportunity for somebody to get in who has the desire to pursue an education here. As Dr. Spencer Robinson also noted, popularity of book ed is through the roof. We have basically twice as many applicants as we have seats. So from the vocational side, our argument is uh, let's not worry about 
the criteria. The criteria, no matter how you shift the criteria, or even if we implement a lottery, which I'm not opposed to necessarily, the bottom line is there's always going to be students who are in, and there are going to be students that are out, uh, no matter how we slice the bread. Uh, my hope and my dream would be that we're not saying no to anybody. If you want the opportunity to get an education at a vocational school, why say no? The solution, we need to create more seats. And that's so from the, the vocational side, how do we create more seats? Uh, obviously, there's a, a dollar figure attached to that. Um, but at the end of the day, are, are we discriminating against protected classes? One challenge that we have through the admissions policy, just again so the board is aware, it is a blind admissions process. We don't know if the applicant is male or female, black, white, um, special ed, non-special ed. We don't know any of, any of that during the admissions policy. So when the data comes out that we submit to DESE, and DESE says uh, that certain schools are biased against certain protected classes, that particular school didn't know that during the admissions process. Uh, this is information that comes to late after the fact. Uh, at Smith, I want to applaud Joe, I want to applaud Goddard's. Um, what's the particular publication that we advertise in now? El Pueblo Latino. Okay, so our hope is we are trying to get the word out to various communities who may not have the information to begin with, which is the other argument that we have within the vocational world, is the information. If families don't have the knowledge that they can't apply to a vocational school, how are they going to apply? So how do we get the word out to all families that this is an opportunity? Uh, so that's the struggle that we're having. So um, I'm on the fence whether I support selective criteria or lottery to be, you know, just putting my opinion out there. Um, I think <coughs> more research has to be done. It is a very hot topic across the state right now, so you're, you're spot on with that. So anyways, but yes, we do have an attorney who's sort of guiding us through this process. I already mentioned UNH negotiations. We had a second session recently. Uh, last Thursday, again, applied the mayor. Uh, we had another city department head uh, meeting. A lot of great information. It was nice just to A, see people, uh, and B, hear what's going on uh, across the city. And uh, I'm going to sort of, I know there's an agenda item later on about a vehicle. Uh, and it was comforting in a way, because we've been struggling to look for a hybrid vehicle. That's going to be your agenda item later. Uh, but they hear the struggle in other departments that they just can't get their hands on hybrid or electric vehicles. Um, it, it boggles my mind. Uh, it's, it's a bigger issue than just Smith vocation. Last Friday, I think it was last Friday, uh, this is bolded because I just want to give you an update on some of the programs that, that are happening around here. So criminal justice, uh, they, they're doing this MRE cooking contest, basically. So if you're unfamiliar with an MRE, that's a made ready to eat. Uh, it's basically a package of astronaut food that uh, you eat if you're in the military or, uh, or whatnot, security perhaps. Um, and the challenge for the students, they were assigned to different teams. They were given four different MRE meals. So each meal is a different team, okay? And they were tasked to take those four MREs, combine them into a three-course meal. Uh, so we had to have an appetizer, a main dish, entree, and a dessert, oh, and a drink. And uh, it was quite interesting. Um, I've had plenty of MREs in my time, and by far these were the best MREs I've ever had. So uh, it was great to watch the students uh, sort of learn you know, the science, and, and this what they might be eating someday if they're, if they're in the military. It was great to see in the classroom. So yesterday, we had the opportunity to host, uh, this was a, a department event meeting, so one of the visions and initiatives that the Department of Ed had this year was to create these regional CCTE meetings. So CCTE is uh, Career and College, uh, College and Career Technical Education. Uh, it's their office at, the, at the, the department. They wanted to go around the state and get our input um, about what's happening within our schools, priorities that we have, issues that we're having, any disconnects between us as a school and the department. And they were struggling to find a host for Franklin and Hampshire County, so I raised my hand. So we hosted the meeting yesterday. Uh, unfortunately, it was a relatively small meeting. It was just us here at Smith, you know, our friends from Franklin County Tech. They were also in attendance, along with the individuals from, from the department. So we had a great meeting in, in a restaurant. I want to thank all of them for providing us a great lunch. And uh, it was just an open and honest dialogue, uh, to be perfectly honest. Uh, all the topics that we've been talking about around admissions and in our struggles to find teachers, uh, plus many more topics uh, we were able to address. 
Uh, Liz Bennett, uh, one of the associate commissioners. Um, Nicole Smith, who is the next level up as far as the chain of command. And uh, I'm forgetting her name. She's a fellow uh, in the department. So those three individuals. This morning we had our, our most recent mindfulness session. And uh, as Mr. Requadio said, we had a property subcommittee uh, a couple hours ago. I'm not going to get into too many of the details. Uh, Mr. Requadio did a great job updating from the property subcommittee, but I just wanted two other updates I, I want the board to know. Uh, one, uh, last month I mentioned how I sent a letter, uh, and then I had a phone call conversation with Smith College about the potential of, of financial support from the college. On February 1st, we were very lucky to receive a letter back from Smith College, and they are awarding the school $150,000. Uh, it's going to be split over two years. So it's a $75,000 donation this year, $75,000 for, ne for next year uh, for part of the rebuild uh, initiative. So I, I do want to thank Smith College. I'm drafting a personal thank you to them. I think it's worthwhile. Uh, and they've asked for an invoice, basically. So we will invoice them for the, do the donation over the next two years. So that will be the process. So I just want to, again, publicly thank Smith College and, uh, and their assistance and support. Now, just to give the board a, another update as the overall financial picture. I know the numbers sort of become, you know, kind of, kind of gloss over, but I think the board needs to know where we stand financially. So as a reminder, insurance settlement for the structure, the, you know, the actual fire of the building, we received just over a million dollars. The last equipment tools insurance settlement was 421,000. The first skills capital grant that again, Mr. Bianca Michardier wrote, uh, we were able to apply $600,000 of that grant towards the rebuild. The more recent second skills capital grant, the larger grant, uh, three and a half million of the five million we can apply towards the rebuild. The economic bond bill, I'm going to continue to thank Senator Comerford. Right now, this is still in the works, okay? This is not off the table. Uh, we are looking at an amendment to the economic bond bill in the amount of 275000 I just mentioned the donation from Smith College, that's 150000 and as of the most recent donations that we received from just individuals in the community and other groups, uh, that's just shy of $40,000. You add all of that up, and as of this moment, we have $6,026,109.31 uh, earmarked for the veto. Uh, it blows my mind. I, I was hoping to be somewhere in the $5 million. You know, we've now crossed over to the $6 million range. Here's the issue, okay? Uh, Mr. Aquadro just mentioned earlier, okay, we finally got the official, again, it's an estimate. Uh, we're still early in the phase, but if we use up even all of those contingency, okay, lines, uh, the total we're looking at right now is 7.4 million. So, again, we're close to one and a half million dollars short. Still, that's if we use all of the contingency needs. If we're able to save some money, that 1.4, you know, make it down close to a million dollars. The bottom line is, as a board, we'll have some serious conversations that will have to happen in the near future of how we're going to close that gap. Um, so that's the current financial package. So a lot of good news, but we still have some difficult conversations that we still have to have and decisions to make on, on closing that gap. <clears throat> I promised last month I'd give you my priorities for the budget, my plan you're going to see looking ahead you know, next month. My plan is to present to the board uh, a draft FY24 budget that will give you a chance to uh, digest you know, our proposal, uh, have a conversation, and uh, gives us time. We have a, an April meeting already scheduled, which is within the timeline of the city, uh, to have a, a final approved budget uh, sent to the mayor in time uh, to follow the bylaws. But just to give the board an update of where I'm standing with our leadership team, some of our priorities. Priority number one is to, is to continue to support all of our academic and vocational programs. Everything is important. We want to make sure that none of our activities <coughs> and none of our programs suffer uh, through any budgets, uh, budget decisions. We want to continue to focus on the, the multiple skills capital grant implementations, i.e. we need to support our administrative team, our facilities team. Uh, there's a lot of management going on right now. Uh, to, to deal with all of, the, all of the grants. It's great news, it's a lot of money we're spending, with a lot of great things for the students. It takes a lot of time and effort. Obviously, top, top priority is to continue to focus on the horticulture building we uh, build. <clears throat> I'm advocating that we add another full-time assistant principal. 
Okay, we are now pushing 600 students as of next year. Uh, there's just the management of the student body has to be top priority. And uh, I know when Mr. Bianca and I started here you know, nine years ago, eight years ago, <clears throat> I think the concern from the faculty was sort of the school climate and culture and, and sort of that, that just the student experience. And I think we did a great job over the last seven or eight years uh, sort of creating a more positive culture and climate for the students, which obviously improves the relationships between you know, the students and the staff. And, uh, and my fear is as we continue to expand the student body, if we don't have the support to manage the student body, we may begin to revert back to some uh, more negative behaviors, which we don't want. So having a second assistant principal would definitely help uh, ensure that doesn't happen. As you know, this fiscal year, uh, we advocated for and thank you to the board to support a, an additional 0.5 FTE for animal science. This is the, the gradual expansion of our animal <coughs> science program. Uh, I want to advocate that that 0.5 <coughs> individual becomes a full FTE in animal science. So we go from two and a half teachers to three teachers in animal science. And lastly, I just want to, uh, again, so thank you to the board, uh, allowing us to expand our farm tech model. This is to really focus on, again, animal science, the overall farm operation, uh, trying to improve the operation down there and the communication between the instructors and uh, the facility side, the farm tech side, operation side of the farm. Uh, historically, we've had three farm techs. Uh, we created a new model this year where we're splitting that farm tech role into two different lanes. We have a farm tech lane and an animal care tech lane. So some individuals are going to be more focused on the care of the animals, working with the educational staff on what animals have to be ready for uh, the teaching and learning of the school. That's the animal care lane. Uh, the farm tech lane is the more of the, the operations of the farm, making sure that the facilities are maintained, make sure that the haying is getting getting done, and, and just sort of the, the grounds of the farm uh, is being kept up to, updated. That model, we're going from three individuals, our goal was to go to four individuals, we're working on that right now. Uh, so we have two individuals on the farm tech lane, two individuals on the animal care tech lane, and my, my vision and my priority would be that we maintain that for next year as well. So those are right now, uh, on February 14th, the priorities for next year. So uh, we'll be talking more, you know, next month as you see a budget in front of you. <coughs> NEAC, this is just uh, to give the, the board an update. So most of you know, I've gotten into this tradition of special reports submitted to the, uh, to the NEAC typically twice a year. So I had to submit a letter back in the fall, uh, just updating the, the association on current events and what's happening here at the school to try to keep ourselves afloat and continue to move forward in, in the 21st century. On January 23rd, I received a letter back to the NEAC. Uh, they met back in the fall. They reviewed my special report, and they did vote to accept without change our membership status. We are, so that in essence, we remain in warning, uh, but they're not pulling the accreditation away from us. Uh, they gave us several noteworthy accommodations, all the great work we're doing here. And uh, yes, I have to submit another special report this spring. And they want me to highlight some recommendations. Um, this is the first time I was telling Ms. Carver earlier today. This might be the first time that the recommendations <coughs> that they're asking me to report on are things that we're already doing and things that are truly attainable. Normally, they wanted me to report on the governance model. You know, what am I doing to work on the governance model? That's next to impossible for one person to deal with the governance model. Uh, so I do appreciate it that the association sort of stepped back in a, and they're allowing us to focus on things that we can try to work on, which is continue to look at the skills capital grants, which is keep working on building the horticultural building, which is uh, working with city officials in the in the Department of Ed, of Ed on various bonding options, other capital assessments, other ways to find money in essence. And finally to continue to work with outside groups and they reference Friends of the Farm, as I mentioned Friends of the Farm in one of my reports, how do we work with outside groups so we can uh, continue to expand the animal science program. So, again, things that we're already talking about, we're already working on, uh, so I can easily put on that. I, I, I thought the issue with the NEAS was our um, physical facility. Is that right or wrong? That's partly yes. Uh, but then the bigger picture how do we solve the physical plant if the financial stability is not stable? And if, go, if we don't have the path forward with the current governance model to finance. Okay. Okay. How many schools have to do a special report? That's a good question. 
So I just, this is not a formal motion, okay? Uh, I forget when, a few months ago, uh, the board voted on uh, the school to create name tags, magnetic name tags for all city department heads. And I you know, just want to remind the board of that, thank the board. You know, our advanced manufacturing program is excited to, to fulfill that, you know, that, that vote. So uh, the machine shop advanced manufacturing gave me some prototypes because we've had some questions internally. And I, I want to thank the mayor and, and the office to give us all the, all the information we need. So we know the city department head names. We know the format that is requested by the city as far as the name of the department head, uh, the actual department, city of Northampton we have, the layout. But just a couple of questions that we had was logos. Okay, uh, I am assuming that we want the city logo, okay, that's sealed, to be displayed on the name tag. Uh, questions have come up around recognition of the school, not recognition of the school. Uh, do we have the school logo on there? Do we not? Do we not? And we have recognition of the school by basically just saying that these name tags were made by the school. Or do we just truly have a city name tag, so the logo with the department head? So they went ahead and just gave some, like a prototype. I'm going to pass it around. Okay. So just some options again. Do we have the city logo and the school logo? Do we go with the city logo and just recognition of the school making the, the name tags? Or do, we, or do we just simply have the city logo and it's a city name tag with no recognition from the school? So you're going to see some examples. Uh, the top example is Mr. Kaleen, uh, back before he was chair. Um, so you can kind of see what has already been created. It is some options. They, they use me as the example. Um, so just pass it around and I just want some input. <clears throat> Recommendation. If anybody says, yes, one thing is better than another, I'd love to take that information back to the machine shop so they can move forward and fulfill that order. So I'll come back to that once I've had the chance and just give me an idea. So donations, uh, we didn't have any donations uh, officially. I've already recognized the big donation that was from Smith College. <coughs> So looking ahead, I already mentioned tomorrow I'll be down in Franklin at uh, the MIA office. Next week, if you're unaware, uh, is February break, so uh, there's no school next week. We come back in February break, we have our next mindfulness session on that Tuesday that we come back. We then enter into March. We have the next scheduled Unit H negotiations on March 1st. That Friday is the monthly Connecticut Valley Superintendent Roundtable luncheon at the Delaney House. Then we have two more weeks of, of mindfulness sessions. Um, we should be wrapping up by that point and then transitioning into our work with City Weeks Bradley. On March 16th, many of the administrators will be spending the afternoon and evening down in Marlboro. Uh, I'll be there earlier for a lot of the officers meeting, well, the board of directors meeting, and then the general membership meeting along with breakouts. Uh, so that's an, an annual tradition down there. And then uh, finally, March 21st, we'll be back together with the board of trustees. I already mentioned next month, the focus will be the FY24 budget. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the board. And again, before we leave tonight, if you don't mind, it's not an official vote, just give me ideas and preferences on the name tag so I can have a sense of what the board wants and I'll give direction to the machine shop. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Gerber. Cheryl? Thank you. Uh, as is customary, I'll yield the beginning of my time to Mandy Wright, our student representative. I just have a few things. Um, we have our clubs, the yearbook. They are submitting pages for approval, um, taking some photos, and we recently identified the seniors, the senior uh, players. We won those. And then a few fundraisers. And the baseball is having a shop cloth sale. Um, members can shop the online gear shop uh, and support the baseball team. Many ways we're going to help team activities, clothing, equipment. And then the Viking Runestone, the Smith Art and Writing Publication. Um, they're having an advertising campaign. Students and staff can sell advertisements to be published in the spring 2023 edition of the Viking Runestone. And that money will uh, help support the publishing class of the magazine. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, <coughs> current enrollment is 563 students. You can see the admissions year over year uh, for February time frame since 2019. So we are currently at 243 applications, 54 or 22.2% from Northampton. Reminder that <clears throat> um, applications are due to Smith uh, mar by March 15th and out of district tuition forms are due on April 1st. Uh, for the budget, Ms. Fairman and I began uh, today building the school budget uh, proposal up to Dr. Lincoln Oker. 
uh, so that he can add in district costs and things uh, and, and give us feedback. <clears throat> we'll continue that tomorrow uh, and then however additional time we need. But I think we're on track to uh, be able to get that prior to that March board meeting so that we can uh, get feedback and adjustments from Dr. Lincoln over here. Uh, we are at the interview phase for electrical instructor and animal science instructor. In athletics, just want to announce that the boys basketball team is again the Tri-County South League champions, two years in a row. Uh, and in wrestling, we're sending seven wrestlers to the state tournament, Mateo Henricks, Evan Latour, A.J. Rubu, Matt Small, Forrest McSweeney, Ari Ginsburg, and Western Mass champion Alex Martinez. On the back, <clears throat> I do want to let the board know that the school and district report card announcement letters uh, are being sent via email. They're scheduled to go out at 6.30 tonight, uh, and it's be posted on our website. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Parks for working with me uh, on that data and those letters and working to get, uh, to get that up on the website as soon as possible. Uh, that's going out in English and Spanish. Some highlights for the board, and uh, I did have Ms. Carver print out in color our report card, <clears throat> so you do have access to that. Uh, I do want to highlight 98.3% uh, of our teachers are, are licensed in their field of study, which is 4.9% higher than the state average. Uh, ninth grade passing rate for us is 94%, which is 16.6% .6 above the state average. And just to let you know that uh, the data is that ninth grade students who pass all of their classes are four times more likely to graduate. 100% of our students complete the mass core requirement. I will say uh, we are helped a little bit in that because vocational schools are waived from the foreign language requirement. However, about 25% of our students uh, do complete that requirement regardless of the waiver through Spanish classes. We're at 95.2% four-year graduation rate, which is 5.4% above the state average. We decreased from 13% to 5%, the students in the not meeting expectations category in ELA. We decreased from 12% to 8%, the students in the not meeting expectations category in math. 47.2% uh, growth in ELA, which is 2.7% below the state average. <clears throat> and we'll continue to focus on that. 54.6% growth in math, which is 4.6% above the state average. Uh, currently, we're at the 26th percentile, but there is no accountability determination assigned to us uh, due to COVID. So, pending your questions, that's my report. I just want to highlight the fact that admissions, <clears throat> talking about the concerns statewide with the admissions, and at my point in my report where I wish I could say yes to all students. I don't want to say no to anybody. Our current admissions policy says that we can accept 150 freshmen. We already have 243 applications. So that's already 93 students that we're going to have to say no to at some point. Um, if you show us more seats and we have more capacity, uh, we can obviously increase the opportunity. So I, I just want to point that out. That was one of my questions, actually, was what percent of applicants we accept. So I'll do the math. That won't be hard. Um, uh, is it, but you, um, I would just caution you because it has to. Be, you have to take into consideration people apply and don't accept their seat. Ultimately, we go down through about 80% of the kids who apply actually get offered a seat. Okay, so it's about 80%. Yeah, 80 to 85%. All right. Um, and these highlights <clears throat> of the report card are fantastic, and you must feel super proud of this school and the performance of your teachers and educational staff and students. Um, okay, I was thinking so there was to, to see um, these students are compared to all high schools. Correct. I would love to see how we look compared to other vocational schools. Um, I, I would expect us to be head and shoulders above, but that mm -hmm. is just my own you know, bias probably. <laughs> um, so I, uh, just for that, maybe those um, first first four um, categories, I think, mm -hmm. especially. Those are the ones that, that interest me. Well, actually, the teachers license in their field. Well, I, I'm kind of curious if it's yeah. harder to get licensed teachers in vocational schools or easier. It can be a longer process. Yeah. 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 Um, but the passing rate, fantastic. 100% of mass core, that's exceptional. I mean, there's lots of high schools where they, they don't come close to it. <coughs> but yeah, so I, I just would like to see that, how we can do that in the book. I, I'll yield to Dr. Lincoln over. I think in the past he's done that yearly, so I, I would assume it would probably be awesome. something that yeah. I'm going to do. I would just want to point out one thing. Uh, thank you. I, I, we are very proud uh, of what the students are able to accomplish and, and the teachers, how they support the students and get them there. I, and I do just want to remind our students double major. Yeah. 
Okay, they are in academics and achieving this in 90 days. Yeah. Uh, so when you see that and other students are maybe in a double block for 90 days <clears throat> or a full 180 day course, uh, you know, our students are doing this. Uh, you know, we do double up in English and math <clears throat> in ninth and 10th grade to try to give them that extra support, but they're really that week on week off for them to be able to hold on to that learning and for the teachers to, to really track where they are and be able to circle back and reignite that because they're not doing it continuously yeah. uh, is even more a point. And I think to Dr. Lincoln's Hoker point, uh, like his point earlier around um, why we use some of the selective criteria we do, that maturity level and that ability to handle that disruption in the continuous learning uh, is very important. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is unique to vocational school experience. Excellent. <coughs> Tim, is there anything on facilities? I know we covered a lot of it with a subcommittee meeting today. Is there any highlights you want to just inform us of? Um, I could talk about the air conditioning project in Seagull. And <coughs> we're going to post that, the bid package, next week. Um, open it up in March 8th and hopefully... In what building? Seagull. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so. so that would hopefully get done this summer. Um, <coughs> The window project's going to get continued next week and start Monday in B building, and they'll have that wrapped up before the week's over. Um, sidewalk reconstruction, we're going to hopefully go out to advertise for that in a few weeks. Um, we've got some decisions to make with the engineer how we want things to look in the end, especially around A building. Um, the old recreation building is being renovated for classroom space for the animal science for uh, kids. Uh, it's all student dead done. So we still anticipate moving those kids in in March and then turn around and demoing the pig barn slash their classroom in April vacation so we can build the companion animal building and then simultaneously re renovate their old classroom for that same program. Um, that's about it. Safety-wise, as far as uh, all this construction that's coming up here, yep. and uh, I just want to make sure that, you know, with all these students on campus and instructors and teachers, that safety is number one. Yeah, the, the biggest thing sure. we have, that's why we tried to get the demolition done during the break. And Oh, yeah. I mean, everyone works together. If, if there's something going on, everyone works together to isolate the spot and make it until sure the kids are around. So. Excellent. Thank you and your crew for the hard work they're doing. And love the windows. Sitting here watching the report, I just my eyes are going there. Absolutely gorgeous. Can I know that the business um, report isn't on our agenda? Right, you, my copy's in there because Crystal's on. So, so we have a copy. Um, I wanted to just, if I could, call people's attention to the last page of the report. Great. Is that all right? Thank you. Um, so if you all could turn to the last page in this very thick packet. Um, this is the at the MASC MASS conference. Um, Dr. Lincoln Hooker and I went to the what was the name of the session, Dr. Lincoln Hooker? The Worcester Finance Team. That's what. That's not the name of it. But, right. Um, but we came away with an understanding of so it's like it's this one with the it's like the really thick one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we came away with an understanding of how our numbers could be presented much more clearly. All of this information is fantastic, but it's incredibly hard to digest. Um, so we, we came away with that appreciation for simplifying it, and then I worked with Crystal for a couple hours. Um, to We took the Worcester categories that they use in their budget, but of course they're a much bigger school system, the second biggest one in the state, and we're much smaller, so we were able to eliminate some categories. But if you, can, if you look at these, in my mind, they make much more sense. So that's supposed to say salaries after that, so administration salaries, we, we've appropriated $1.1 million. Um, Board of Trustees stipends. I'm like, 384000 Really? Is it that high? We can ask Crystal at the next meeting, but... Our I think this is all, all the numbers in that cost center. Yeah. Not just salaries. Right. We had talked about it being stipends. But, um, yeah, so a conversation with Hertz. But this is a start. So we have... <coughs> the, she, uh, Someone else has prepared this report for us, which is awesome because it's a lot of work. But you can see, like, the instructional assistance, farm maintenance, retirement. And you can see teachers, obviously, our big, biggest line in there. 5.6 million um, vocational assistance, and then so this is that top section is all personnel, 
and then the bottom section is facilities, athletics, um, structural materials, utilities. So it's there. So this is our total budget, our ten million dollar budget, but grouped into categories that, for the layperson, mm -hmm. I think are easier to Very understand and, sure. and digest. So I'm really excited that this is here in our report, and um, she will provide that for us quarterly. Excellent. Yeah. So we have it as a way, you know, to to take all of this and and make sense of it. Perfect. Appreciate your wonderful Yes, thank you, Dr. Julie. You're welcome. So under new business, may I have a motion a second to approve a one-day and out-of-state field trip to Sunny Coposkill, April 11th, 2023, <coughs> for 10th and through 12th grade students in agriculture and criminal justice? So much. Yep. All right. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. They have a motion to second to approve payment FY22 invoice to Cisco Company $750.67 from Culinary Arts Revolving. Question. Please. Um, refresh my memory. Why is this sort of item on our agenda when we um, sign off on warrants regularly. Why is this different that it needs to be here? Because we're paying a, a previous fiscal year's invoice, so it has to come forward to the board. For that. Okay, so, the so that's the short point. answer. I can't comment specifically on that specific invoice why it's coming in late. Okay, uh, I can't comment on that. I'm not sure. All right, thank you. No difference. Second. Thank you. Any other further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> this is an important one right here. May I have a motion and a second to approve purchasing a table of eight for the St. Patrick's Day breakfast uh, for $228 that would be taken out of the trustee's account. So moved. Second. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how this is important to our school? Well, it is a public relations uh, one for the whole city does gather uh, on St. Patrick's for this breakfast, as well as there's floats being built to represent the city that go down the streets of Hoyo. Uh, my father came from Ireland, and, uh, and it's in, the, in our blood that uh, we've been building floats and supporting Irish heritage for many years. And the thing is that the school has been involved for many years. Earlier, we built a lot of floats right here on campus. and. Uh, so the thing is that the recognition of the whole city, and the mayor will give her green, uh, is, is just we're representing Smith's Vocational as well as the other city departments. And there's banks and businesses that are there, but uh, green is the color of the day. Thank you. So may I have a motion and a second? Yes. Okay. Any mm -hmm. further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Yeah. May I have a motion and a second for discussion and possible action on the December 20th, 2022 motion to go out the bid for a 7 through 10 passenger vehicle. I believe that there, uh, what happened, and, and I'll let the superintendent talk about, but apparently there was some concern about this was supposed to be a hybrid vehicle uh, or electric vehicle. And uh, Tim had done his best to go out to bid to try and get one under the specifications that we were trying to do for a smaller band to be able to utilize. Uh, it came up that the vehicle didn't seem to be available. On the original boat that came up, it was not really clear that this was going to replace the hybrid or electric vehicle. We did boat on a band. Uh, but again, we're going back to a gas vehicle that uh, originally was supposed to be a hybrid or electric and it went through because I thought it was going to be used for sports or carrying a large amount of children, but it isn't. This is a vehicle that's supposed to be used internally within the school. Uh, and we did put four chargers here, right two up front, Tim? Eight. And two up back? Four and four. Yeah. So we have the electric capability of the city, I know you talked about it in that meeting, 
uh, is, is going electric. Uh, we're trying. And uh, the city of East Hampton was on the front page of yep. the newspaper the other day talking about hiring a person to go all electric with their vehicles. I just think that as a chairperson, my own personal feeling is that we're going backwards if you're buying gas vehicles in an electric climate. And, uh, but I'll let the superintendent redo it. Right, so the reason I asked for this to be a motion at the last, in December I think it was, uh, we have a current need for a student activity vehicle. Uh, not necessarily the size of a, one of our small buses, uh, but something for uh, a smaller vehicle to get a number of students to, whether it's job sites, uh, the rotations for health assisting, uh, co-op interviews, so on and so forth. So something smaller than the actual large bus, but something bigger than uh, like a, a small vehicle. Uh, what also came to head at the same time was that we have been using our criminal justice SUV uh, for that purpose. Now granted that SUV uh, isn't as large as a, a, of a bus, but it's also not as big as a more traditional van, uh, but we were putting individuals in the backseat of the SUV uh, cruiser. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Bianca for being uh, observant enough. Uh, we actually were using it one particular day and we realized uh, that any individual sitting in the back seat of that particular cruiser, they were locked in uh, because it was a former cruiser. So from a safety standpoint and potential liability standpoint, if that cruiser ever got into an accident, uh, the passenger <coughs> in the back seat would not be able to get out of the vehicle uh, and that was not a good thing. So uh, we sort of banned that vehicle uh, from the fleet of our vehicles for the time being. Uh, and we were talking as a leadership team that uh, we need something on campus for that particular need. Uh, knowing that we've been striking out trying to get a hybrid van, um, that's why I brought it forward to the, uh, to the board. The other component uh, that I was just trying to be transparent about was even if we were able to get our hands on a hybrid vehicle, I wanted to, the board to be cognizant of the potential increase of the cost for a comparable vehicle. And does the board support that or not? Uh, knowing that we have increased costs because of the fire. Um, so that's why it came forward. To look at the need, we need our hands on something. You know, if we can't get our hands on a hybrid vehicle, uh, I don't think there's any disagreement that nobody wants a hybrid vehicle. It was, we have a need for a student activity vehicle. We need something sooner than later. And if we're talking about it, I just want the board to be aware of the cost. Uh, I just want to be transparent again. Uh, as of this afternoon, I thank Mr. Bianca for giving me an update. The SUV that I just referenced, um, thank you to the Northampton Police Department. They actually took the vehicle back and they did modify it. So we are able to use it as a traditional SUV now. So uh, they installed uh, seat belts in the back seat. We are able to get out of the back doors now. So it is a more traditional SUV. Uh, so it, we are going to allow it to back into operation. It doesn't solve the problem if we have more than two or three students. Uh, you know, it solves that problem, but if we have five to seven students, what do we do? We can't cram them all in the SUV. So this still is a need. I just want the board to be aware that that SUV is back in operation. So if that drives the conversation for pun intended one way or the other, um, I just want the board to have all the information. My understanding from when we talked about this back in December was that um, we did want a hybrid vehicle but were unable to find one and that there was an urgency to obtaining a vehicle and so we agreed to um, broaden the, the specifications for it to include a gas-powered one if we couldn't find a hybrid. Um, so I think it's, we, we want a hybrid, that's our first choice, but well, our first choice is getting a vehicle because I think that we approved it way before December. Like you've been wanting a vehicle for quite a while, I think. I mean, the original motion that Mr. Kalen, you're referencing is the previous December. That would be December of 21, uh, which was then amended in December of 22. So, yes, we've been looking for a vehicle yeah. for a long time. So, <laughs> does the urgency in meeting the student need on campus now outweigh the commitment that I think we all share to, you know, a, a greener uh, campus. So as Dr. Lincoln was saying, um, at the department head meeting, we were sort of, this is, this is an issue we're having with a lot of departments. Um, the supply chain issues, particularly around electric vehicles um, and in the Commonwealth. So 
what, some luck that you heard Chief Casper had was to look outside of Massachusetts and particularly look for states where there's less interest, so like more conservative states. Um, New Hampshire, she found some vehicles, but also like Florida or, or places in the south. Sometimes they'll have them on the lot where you won't be able to find them anywhere in sort of New England, um, except for maybe New Hampshire. So that's an idea, but this is something that we're all really, really struggling with. You know, it's, we're all trying to green our fleets um, at the same time, at the same time that there's huge supply chain issues, particularly around electronics. So it's, you are not at all unique in this problem, unfortunately. And sometimes you have to make tough decisions to, to meet a, an immediate need, um, even though there's such a strong commitment to for us all to move in this direction. You want to re re this as yeah, well. that, that was actually my next, my question. Was so if we approve this in December to broaden, let them broaden the search. Certainly prioritize a hybrid. We, yeah. that, we would all like to see that. Yeah. Um, but we need to meet the demand right. on kids, right? So we approved in December to broaden that search. Can we just let things stand, or do we need to we vote again? No, I don't think we need to vote again. It was a matter if there was do it. No. Okay. It was a matter of wanting clarification, clarification on that. Yeah, on the understood. Understood. Understanding the issue, uh, I concur to go awesome. go ahead and go forward with. Uh, Look at all the states. If, if the <laughs> needs there, we get up to the need. So you will support a road trip to Florida to pick up five. <laughs> I'm in. Okay. <laughs> I get on the car. I understand. He's free <laughs> next week. Mr. I've been Kayla. there, done that. <laughs> Are we are we still looking for a price of Pacifica then? No, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead, Tim, with the state what the state can get us uh, to fill the need for that vehicle that you had originally checked with a local dealer. No, no, these are I was looking at the combines list, but yeah, for that specific price of Pacifica. Well, so I'm looking for for price, but availability is more the the need. Of, Right, but so I, I can just go out to bid yeah. and, and put it on Central Register and call around, but for that vehicle. Go ahead. For that Chrysler Pacific. Uh, well, I mean, it's look at a comparable price. We know it's going to be more expensive if, if it's a hybrid. Yeah, I, I that's what it is. But I just don't. Yeah. But I guess I just, I just want real clarification on what vehicle we're looking for. What Priority model would be a hybrid van that hold seven to ten passengers. Okay. But if not limited to hybrid. If we can't find a hybrid. Correct. Well, hybrid preferred, but yeah. not mandatory. Are you hybrid hybrid or or electric? Electric? limited to Chrysler? Hybrid That's what I was asked to find. Yeah, I am just a van. Does it have hybrid to be, can or we limit the search to a, a make? There are other vans that are, there's like, Toyota has one too, I think. I, yep, but I was specifically asked to find that. Uh. that. So if we're going to open it up, I can I can do that. But is there a reason why it's being limited to Chrysler? No, no. The the uh, van we looked at initially mm -hmm. happened to be a Chrysler hybrid that was gas electric, mm -hmm. and it held all the people that we needed, and uh, and it filled the need at that time. Mm -hmm. But it is more expensive. It's, it's probably ten thousand or twelve thousand more than a standard vehicle. But is it okay if the search gets brought into something other than yes. Chrysler? Because oh, there yeah. are other oh, minivans that yeah. are hybrid. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Well, it's a neat situation. The next one is, uh, may I have a motion, a second discussion, uh, vote on December 20th, March. Oh, no, that's it. Okay, that's on there. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Page two. Yeah, may I have a motion, a second? Discussion for a standardized annual lo oh, longevity for all employees, five or more years, seven hundred and fifty dollars, ten or more years, two thousand dollars, fifteen or more years of service, twenty five hundred. Uh, you want so, to talk to that? So we move, move first and then so move. Yes, we can. Second. Okay. Yeah. So um, at our meeting last April, when we voted to approve this year's budget, we also voted to have a discussion about longevity benefits for non-represented employees to the February board meeting when we would have a clearer sense of the revenue picture. 
Um, I would like to make a motion now that we refer consideration of the longevity benefits to our negotiation subcommittee, our newly formed negotiation subcommittee, no. and request that a proposal is presented to the full board at our next meeting. Um, we, the reason why I am making that proposal is we were just given the information today um, with the longevity um, right, the benefits that are being paid and not paid to the different employees and realizing I, I wanted to see what it looked like in Northampton and the Northampton Public Schools because they're also a city, you know, city department and um, just make sure we're addressing all of the questions that we might have around it and then bring a proposal that has been, is fully formed and has been um, completely explored. So that's, that's my motion. Okay. That we refer this to the, to the negotiation subcommittee. Right. Yeah. All in favor? Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. <clears throat> May I have a motion and a second to begin a capital campaign uh, for raising money for the school? Uh, Rick, do you want to talk to that? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay, motion. So motion. Second. Um, just, well, for instance, take uh, the article in the paper recently about, uh, what was her name, Rebecca Walun Walunas from Fleming, mm -hmm. how she's uh, cracked the glass barrier in terms of her trade as a, as a woman plumber, that I think we need to... Um, reach out to our alumni, our stakeholders, everybody involved, city beyond our, our uh, sending districts, that we need to start raising money internally because we're not necessarily going to get all the money from grants in the state and the feds. And I think it would be worthwhile endeavor to do that to actually hopefully uh, build some pride in the school, uh, toot our own horn, and uh, let people know uh, what we're all about. And uh, hopefully they'll buy into it and contribute. Um, I just think it's time. And along with that, I had, uh, you know, we've been, we've been um, struggling with uh, grant writing and we've been doing it in house and God bless uh, Joe and his staff and everybody in, on board doing the grant writing. Um, maybe we can dub that position and if we went outside the box and hired, say, a capital, capital campaign manager, maybe they had expertise and also grant writing. Um, just throwing it out there for discussion. So would this be a limited campaign or sort of like an annual campaign? Would it be sort of directed towards a certain... Good question. I want to get the discussion going um, so we can start fine-tuning what... We know we have a need for money and we have an immediate need for money for the horticultural rebuild, which we need to figure out. And that kind of got my uh, the wheels turning in regards to where are we going to find some money. Um, so I'm not specifically advocating that that be for the horticultural building, but maybe it may, may, need, <coughs> may need to be. Um, I want to, you know, get the conversation going to start fine-tuning what we should do. My time of work. Pardon? <laughs> when I was in college, the president went around to everyone and said, please buy a brick. Yeah, yeah buy a brick. Yeah, there you go. And that was alumni brick. So the yeah. new building, figure how many bricks it was buying a brick. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have um, a question to add to it. I am um, really interested in increasing the breadth of our scholarships that we offer to students to make sure that all of the shops are covered in, in the academic areas as well. And I, I know that, that, that a scholarship fund is different from a capital campaign, but I'm also thinking you know, if we're going out and making contact with folks, if there could be some coordination between that, or if I'm a, like, so Becca Walloon is, is, is young and just getting started, she might not be able to make a contribution to a capital right, campaign, right, but, but she could make a donation to the scholarship, she could have a scholarship in her name. So I'm just wondering about the um, feasibility of 
combining efforts, or I, I, I don't know how. Well, my work. suggestion is that that we approve this, yeah, and then we form a committee, yeah, uh, to take all these ideas that are starting to roll here, yeah, and collect them, and then bring it back to the board, yeah, to to uh, advertise it. That's what I recommend. Okay. So we've approved it. I'm just kind of, uh, as far as. So do we amend this um, action or he's discussion saying, slash? He's saying no. I, th I think we've got the. This has got the content. Okay. In regards to leave it the way it is, and then take this and build on it. Build on it with a committee. Any, any thoughts on that? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think even the motion as is would right. empower me to right. do the next step. Um, I would agree with the mayor. I think my first question was sort of what the mayor asked. You know, are we looking at a specific capital campaign project, or is this sort of an ongoing? Uh, I, I know the struggles. Uh, again, I, I keep thinking, Mr. Bianca, over the years, trying to get the alumni association up and running. We've tried alumni weekends. We've tried this. We've tried that. It's tough. It's it's difficult. Um, and I just know, in working with the Hilltown Health Network, uh, with the potential. Uh, Health Center, they've actually went out and hired a campaign manager, and uh, I think they're going to face some difficulties. Uh, and that's a focused campaign initiative for one particular project. So I think people are more willing to donate when there's a specific goal in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you see the thermometer on the front yard, right. you know, that, that thermometer is for a particular project. Um, so those are my just my questions that have to be answered, but I think if the board votes on creating this, I think. Those questions have to be answered within within a committee. I would agree. Um, there's nobody on staff right now that has a the expertise and b the time uh, to take on a capital campaign, let alone you know writing grants, which is why we're looking for the grant writer. Um, so I, I've already made, made my opinion known that if we have a capital campaign, we need to have a professional overseeing it, which again costs money, and we have to see that money from somewhere. So. You know, we want to raise money, but we need money to raise the money. So, you know, I just put that out there. I have one more question for the superintendent. Um, how does Friends of the Farm relate to this, like, charitable world? My vision, at the onset of the fire, and even before that, and I sort of got this idea uh, a few years ago. Uh, Monty Tech, uh, up in Pittsburgh, they're a large regional folk school. I think they have 19 member districts. And uh, they wanted to create a vet assisting program. Uh, so they did. But the superintendent at the time, uh, her school committee said, go for it. Apply for the vet assistant program, uh, but we're not going to give you a dime uh, as far as construction costs. Um, so she had to figure out how to raise the money. Um, so uh, Monty Tech has a nonprofit organization very similar to our Friends of the Park. And she used that particular uh, charity group to raise all the money. Uh, so the money was funneled through that charity uh, group given back to the school as they were building the, the building. So I thought, geez, we already have Friends of the Farm, so could we be, this is before the fire, we already had the vision to expand the animal science uh, program, could we do that? Uh, I had meetings with the, the individuals who were involved with Friends of the Farm. The challenge is there's no expertise within the Friends of the Farm to take that initiative and run with it. Uh, they have very little membership, and their membership they just don't have that skill set. It's a special skill set. Uh, so I think we have the, the structure in place, but you don't have the people in that structure to take it along with it. Where did Monty Tech get the expertise? I'm not sure who was on there within that group, Yeah. Uh, but they did a lot of fundraising. Talking about selling bricks, they, because this was a vet assisting capital campaign, they had a photo booth where you could bring your dog in to lunch and have a photo with your dog. They had a lot of bake sales. They had a lot of mm -hmm. fundraising. But, uh, and they had a they had a raise I think two and a half to three million dollars. So maybe something if we form this committee to reach out to them to say sure. what did you learn? Yeah. Well, the, the other thing on our friends of the farm that's a five hundred one three C nonprofit, so yeah. we already have that in place. Yeah. That's so I was wondering how that connected to this. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we have the structure. We just need right. the people. Right. Yeah, that's. I've been striking out. I, I know we keep talking about different ideas. There's been a lot of wonderful ideas. It's, we need the person who can take it and make Correct. it happen. All right. Question. Please. We have this entity, Friends of the Farm. Um, I know nothing about it. 
I've seen no publicity about it. I've seen no reach out from this group about it. Um, <laughs> what, what, what are they doing? It was originally many, many, many years ago when that the farm was threatened to be abolished. Yeah. And there was a collective group put together called Friends of the Farm. They turned around and put the 5013C together and they put together the money to, through that vehicle to bring the money back that the school didn't have to sustain the farm. So that's where it was formed, but it's been kind of run uh, very loosely uh, since. So the, we need more structure as you well, said. That's where I'm going with this. Um, Pierce, what you just said, Mr. Kaling, we need more structure to that entity and um, get the word out there and, uh, you know, Dr. Andy brought up the fact that we have this entity, you know, yes, we certainly need a subcommittee to start figuring this all out. The entity is, <coughs> technically, is, it's not directly tied to the school. Okay. So I don't it's have any operational vehicle. oversight. It's a separate vehicle. Uh, and we have to keep that separation. Yeah. Uh, so during the transition of the last election and with the vision of animal science and trying to expand, uh, I had conversations with Mr. Fitzgerald, the former trustee, and, uh, and he's he's involved, but again, uh, he has a, a lot of great skill set, uh, but his skill set is not in marketing and fundraising. fundraising. Right. Um, and, and that's no disrespect to Mr. Fitzgerald. Uh, he has a love <coughs> for the school, a love for the, the farm, which is bonus points. Uh, so he has the passion, it's just, we all have the passion, it's just, who is the president of Friends of the Farm? Do you know? Well, like I said, there's Mr. Fitzgerald. Is Mr. Cotton still on that or not? I yeah. don't know. We, it needs to be visited. But and prior to their involvement, it was a former superintendent who's now been retired. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we do have a motion and a second. Um, they, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So where do we go from here? We're, we're going to form a committee, but this is okay. the vehicle. Uh, future business, March 21st, regular board meeting here. April 11th, the same. May 16th, the same. Upcoming events, March 22nd, program advisory committee dinner and meetings, 6 o'clock in the cafeteria. Your Honor, we'd love to have you there. And Dr. Pearson Kimball as well. If, if you're here, love and to have you. a delicious meal. Uh, April 4th through 6th, 2023, FFA State Convention. Uh, they changed the locations at the Sheridan Framingham Hotel and Conference Center. April 13th, 2023, MAVA Outstanding Vocational Student Awards Banquet, Mechanics Hall in Worcester. And may I have a motion to adjourn? So much. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yeah.